On clear summer nights, we have long watched in awe as a broad band of light rose up across the sky. Now we know that behind this luminous veil of gas and stars, a restless universe is being shaped. By shattering collisions, explosions, and shock waves. Two groups of astronomers are tracking a star that has accelerated to mind-boggling speeds. They believe it holds clues to the origin and nature of a mysterious object that's lurking deep within the galaxy. What are they learning about the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way? To observers in distant space, our Milky Way galaxy would look something like this. A flat spiral with vast arcs of gas, dust, and about 200 billion stars swirling around it. The center, bulging up and out of the galactic disk, is tightly packed with stars. Thick dust and blinding starlight have long obscured our view of the mysterious inner regions of the bulge. And yet, the clues had been piling up that something important, something strange, is lurking there. The first to take notice was the physicist Carl Jansky back in the 1930s. He had been asked by his employer, Bell Telephone Labs, to investigate sources of static that might interfere with what it saw as the killer app of its time. Radio voice transmissions. Using this ungainly radio receiver, Jansky methodically scanned the airwaves. He traced most of the static to thunderstorms, nearby and far away. There was one signal he could not explain. It was a hiss of radio noise that sounded like steam. Jansky narrowed it to a region in the sky, the constellation of Sagittarius, in the direction of the center of the galaxy. Located within a larger pattern of radio emissions, Jansky's source would become known as Sagittarius A. Word of Jansky's finding got out. He assured the public that it was not aliens seeking contact. Whether it was or wasn't, no one could really say for the next three decades. Then a young astronomer named Eric Becklin got interested in probing deeper into the galactic center. Sagittarius rises right about there. First comes Scorpio around midnight, and then Sagittarius and the very big Milky Way and the very core Beckley of the galaxy. Becklin is one of those right rare there. researchers whose curiosity and determination push our understanding to a whole new level. It was the 1960s, and astronomy, like society, was in a period of ferment. Astronomers were peering into ever more distant corners of the universe, looking for answers to a whole new set of questions. When Eric began his career, a class of extremely powerful radio beacons called quasars had just been discovered in distant space. What powerful objects were generating them? 
did they come from the bright centers of galaxies, as some astronomers suspected? To look into the center of another galaxy, you have to pinpoint its precise location. Young Becklin first took aim at our luminous neighbor, Andromeda. In this recent ultraviolet image, you can see a dense glow in the middle. Becklin found the point where the light reaches peak intensity and marked it as the center. From our orientation in space, the Andromeda galaxy is in full view. But our galaxy is a different story. We live inside it. To pinpoint its center, Becklin had to find a way to see through all the dust and gas that obscure our line of sight. He went to a military contractor and obtained a device that reads infrared light. Its wavelengths are similar to the distances between particles in a dust cloud which allow it to move right through the dust. Looking toward the galactic center, Becklin began measuring the brightness of infrared light as it rose to a peak, marking its exact location. Thus began Becklin's long quest to see what lies deep in the Milky Way's heart. that this is the center of the cluster. Becklin wasn't the only astronomer interested in the galactic center. Reinhard Genso and a team based at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany began a similar campaign in 1990. They came to the mountains of Chile and South America to use the recently christened New Technology Telescope of the European Southern Observatory. A few years later, in 1993, high atop Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano, Eric Becklin and colleagues, including Andrea Gates, began using the giant new 10-meter Keck telescope. The American and German groups shared the same goal to identify the source of radiation first observed by Carl Jansky. They found that most of the energy is coming from a region they called Sagittarius A star. This is our road map. And that's the center of our galaxy. That is too small and dim to actually see. That was not true of stars that are orbiting around it. Tracking the precise locations of these stars would take the sensitivity of Keck's wide aperture. You can ask, how well can we position stars in our field of view? And it's, um, we can position things to two centimeters in L.A. If, as viewed from New York. So you can basically tell somebody's um, waving like this with their finger in Los Angeles as viewed from New York. It's powerful enough to detect an object with the luminosity of a candle on the moon. Meanwhile, astronomers had focused the new Hubble Space Telescope on a different galaxy. A giant elliptical cloud made up of nearly a trillion stars, 50 million light years away, called M87. They tracked gas whipping around its center at speeds of almost two million kilometers per hour. That led them to calculate the mass of the gravitational source at M87 center at four billion times that of our sun. This measurement, the first of its kind, pointed to the presence of a black hole of truly supermassive proportions. 
but that did not conclusively prove its identity. If a supermassive black hole lay at the center of our galaxy, the German and American teams each hoped that Earth's proximity would allow them to assemble conclusive evidence. Their search was part of a larger effort to map the layout of our galaxy and find clues to its history. Astronomers were eager to train a new generation of space telescopes, the great observatories on the galactic center. Using Hubble, astronomers documented vast arcs of gas heated up by ferocious winds from large stars. Capturing infrared light, the Spitzer Space Telescope picked up the swirling heat signatures of dense star concentrations. The Chandra X-ray Observatory recorded multiple sources of high-energy radiation, most likely been off by ultra-dense neutron stars and small black holes. Based on Chandra data, scientists estimated that a swarm of 20,000 black holes likely inhabits the inner three light years of the galactic center. If we would stand in the center of the, ga the galactic center right now, first of all, there would be stars all around us. You know, Very unlike the situation we're used to, where we have one sun in that direction, that's it. There will be stars all around us. And very massive stars, lots of radiation. It would be very, I mean, we couldn't exist there. There's lots of ultraviolet radiation, x rays are floating around, gas clouds bash into each other. And then, of course, the black hole itself, from time to time, accretes material and then releases radiation. So it's a very hostile environment, really. To show there's a supermassive black hole in the center, the teams would have to prove that it's confined to a very small region and that it has enough gravity to whip the stars orbiting it to high speed. The light of these stars travels 26,000 light years to reach us, only to be blurred in the last few kilometers as it hits the Earth's atmosphere. So both teams turned to new methods designed to sharpen the light. The idea was to snap thousands of pictures in a short time. Because the atmosphere is in motion, a star's apparent position may shift from image to image. To pinpoint the star's true location, a computer averages the positions and looks for correlations in the wavelength of the star's light. The first few years' data allowed the teams to calculate the speeds of these stars and their rough trajectories around the center. These um, stars are going as fast as 10,000 kilometers per second when they go through closest approach. That's going about 3% uh, the speed of light. Keep our fingers crossed. That allowed them to narrow the position of their target and to calculate the strength of its gravitational pull. That gave them its mass, roughly three million times that of our sun. Because no other single object is known to weigh that much, it was strong evidence of a black hole but it was still not ironclad proof. Their data, for example, didn't rule out a dense concentration of stars packed into the center, held there by their mutual gravity. The proof the team sought would come in the wake of an extraordinary event. In the early years of the new century, large telescopes around the world began to install upgrades. 
Most large new telescope mirrors these days are thin, designed to be mounted on metal scaffolding. Behind the mirrors, engineers install pistons and motors to subtly correct the shape of the glass as changing temperatures deform it. Or as atmospheric turbulence blurs the incoming light. To these adaptive optic systems, they added lasers, designed to project an artificial star onto the upper atmosphere. As turbulence distorts its light, a computer subtracts the same degree of distortion from the light of the real stars, bringing them back into focus. This is a Keck telescope image of the galactic center. Without adaptive optics applied, and with it, this increase in sharpness allowed the teams to see what happened in 2002. The German team had begun making observations from the new Very Large Telescope Array at the Paranal Observatory in northern Chile. In the spring of that year, one of the stars they had been following, known as S2, made a dramatic move. S2 suddenly swooped around the center, accelerating to an astonishing 18 million kilometers per hour. The American team saw it too. It had come incredibly close to the suspected black hole, about three times the distance between the Sun and Pluto. If there had been a cluster of stars in there, S2's path and its light would have wobbled. It did not. This was the evidence the teams had sought. It showed that Sagittarius A star is a single object. Without doubt, it could now be called a black hole. This observation came at a time when astronomers had begun to believe that supermassive black holes play an active role in the evolution of galaxies. They had found that they occupy the centers of nearly every large galaxy. In fact, the larger the galaxy, the larger the black hole. That suggests that the two must have evolved hand in hand each shaping the life story of the other. As matter flows into a black hole, it heats up to millions of degrees. Despite the black hole's intense gravity, much of the inflowing matter blows off in fierce winds and shoots out in powerful jets that roar out of its poles. The more matter that rushes in, the more the black hole pushes back out. The force and heat from an active black hole can have the effect of limiting a galaxy's growth by slowing star birth and by pushing gas out of its central region. As a result, a strict relationship has developed between the size of the black hole and the size of the galactic bulge that surrounds it. The astronomers wanted to know, is the Milky Way's own supermassive black hole still active and growing? Or has it gone dormant? Just as the black hole that Sagittarius A star revealed its existence, it would show its true colors.
the year 2001. Scientists were beginning to work with the recently launched Chandra X-ray Space Telescope. They pointed it at Sagittarius A star. And by chance, at that moment, the black hole erupted. The teams on the ground began focusing on it for longer periods, hoping to see it happen again. And so they did. They saw what are now thought to be flares, outbursts that take place when matter builds up near the event horizon. When it falls in, around once an Earth day, the black hole lights up. Okay, here we can clearly see a region between those two sources where there is no other object. And here we have the same region, the same two sources, and now in between we see an additional source. So this is the flaring state of Sagittarius A star. As gas, gas clouds if you like, come in, they sort of spiral into this innermost regions and get ever hotter before they disappear. And in the very innermost region, just before it disappears from our side, that's where they would be the hottest. And so an accretion event, think of it sort of a clump, falls into the, falls into the center. Could also look like that. A group of astronomers is now making plans to get a closer look at these flares, and perhaps to directly glimpse the black hole. From Earth, it is but the size of a grapefruit on the moon. No single telescope on Earth has enough resolution to see something so small, so far away. Astronomers think that they will be able to see it by linking observatories around the world to create what amounts to an Earth-sized radio telescope known as the Event Horizon Telescope. This simulation shows what they expect to see. A supermassive black hole in silhouette, framed by eruptions on its surface that travel around the monster as it spins. The reason that this periodicity, the fact that things change um, uh, repetitively the same, in the same way over a certain time scale, um, is that the material's orbiting the black hole. And so this time scale corresponds to the time it takes to go completely around the black hole. And so that also tells you how close it is to the black hole. And the, the key here is that if the black hole's not rotating, if there's no rotating, the shortest period that you should be able to detect is about 24 minutes. So if it is rotating and you think it is coming from the secretion disk, then um, that's telling you that the, the black hole is spinning because material can get closer if it's spinning faster. Meanwhile, astronomers have mounted a major effort to map the turbulent environment of Sagittarius A star, to shed light on the monster's current state and how it might change. The great space observatories, Hubble, Spitzer, and Chandra, combined to produce the most detailed image yet of the galactic center. In this image, the central zone, 160 light years across, stretches out like a vast claw. Sagittarius A star is the X-ray hot region on the lower wrist. Out on the hand is a dense grouping of about a thousand stars, called the Arches Cluster. It formed just a few million years ago. Only its tight formation saves it from being torn apart by the intense tidal forces at the center. Below is the Quintuplet Cluster, with the largest star documented in the Milky Way. The pistol star weighs in at 150 times the mass of the sun. Large stars like these generate fierce winds of plasma that fill the galactic center. 
they should provide a steady diet for the black hole and cause it to glow brightly. Monitoring X-ray emissions with the Chandra telescope, astronomers found that these and other large stars are just a little too far away to feed the monster. As gas swirls in, a portion heats up and pushes outward. This outward wind is enough to block much of what's flowing in. So what would cause it to flare up? A separate study suggested that what's falling in is not gas, but comets and asteroids that had been stripped away from stars whose orbits had brought them in close. This is the center of the cluster, and you know, Sergei Star was over there. The that black hole remains well, in a state of semi-retirement. But nevertheless, this is a bit of a puzzle that there are so many of the blue stars. Will it become active nice. again? Working in the cold, clear air of the Antarctic, one group of radio astronomers surveyed the broader region surrounding the galactic center. Data from their South Pole telescope contained signs that a spectacular flare-up is slowly materializing. A huge ring of gas looms beyond the galactic center. When it accumulates some 300 million solar masses worth of matter, it will reach a tipping point. The cloud will begin to funnel into a second ring that orbits close to the center. This inner ring will condense, then erupt with star formation, before spiraling down toward the ravenous black hole. As the cloud falls into it, the black hole will erupt in a blaze of glory visible across much of the universe. Don't wait around for them. Such outbursts happen every 400 million years or so. There is another much smaller cloud that is now on a black hole rendezvous. The cloud, weighing several times the mass of Earth, approached ground zero. This simulation shows the cloud passing within less than a fifth of a light year. It stretched out as the black hole began ripping it apart. Its momentum will carry most of it swirling past the black hole. In time, it will settle into an orbit and slowly but surely collapse into the center. Meanwhile, on a rocky outpost, 25,000 light years from the turmoil of the galactic center, astronomers continue to watch for surprises. They have found ways to track patterns of change shaping our universe over billions of years' time. And yet, it's often the small and sudden events that feed their sense of wonder. Since they started their work, these groups became the first to witness an object making a complete orbit around the center of the galaxy. The star S2 does it every 16 Earth years. Its dimmer cousin, S102, goes around every 11.5 years. No doubt, over the course of their next orbits, we'll answer many of the questions that swirl around their companion, the supermassive black hole.
how did it form and shape the galaxy that surrounds it? Will it one day, from the dim heart of the Milky Way, become bright and powerful enough to light up the universe? How did the universe come to be? Why does it look the way it does? How did galaxies form? Planets? And solar systems? Life? To find the answers, a series of missions has transported a battery of high-tech instruments above Earth's atmosphere. To peer into the most violent processes in nature. And explore the mysterious workings of the high-energy universe. Decades ago, High-energy astronomy was motivated by a number of basic questions. Do supermassive black holes really exist? What are quasi-stellar objects or quasars? Are they solitary objects in the vast darkness? Or are they part of larger structures? In the early 80s, a diffuse X-ray glow was seen filling the night sky. What was it? Bursts of ultra-high-energy gamma radiation appeared almost once a day, lasting seconds, or as long as a day. Are these events nearby? even within our solar system? Or are they extremely distant and highly energetic? Finally, astronomers suspected that supernovae were violent explosions. But what was their exact nature? We now know that they are the final moments in the lives of large stars. And that they are the source of elements that make up our bodies. Calcium, iron, carbon, and so on. Because high-energy light does not penetrate our atmosphere, scientists launched a fleet of space observatories designed to capture wavelength bands from gamma ray to infrared. These wavelengths tell us the temperature of matter in an object. Gamma rays and X-rays, tens to hundreds of millions of degrees. Ultraviolet, hundreds of thousands. Visible light, tens of thousands. Infrared, hundreds of degrees. Here is a Hubble Space Telescope image of Cassiopeia A. It shows the visible remnant of a supernova, glowing at about 10 or 20,000 degrees Celsius. Here is an image from the Chandra X-ray Observatory showing gas heated to tens of millions of degrees. Some of the first images from the Hubble telescope in 1994 captured the galaxy M87. For the first time, astronomers spotted the hot gas swirling around its central region. 
Knowing the scale of this picture and the speed of the gas, astronomers discovered that within a volume of less than a solar system, there is an object that weighs some three billion times the mass of the sun. Nothing that dense can be anything but a black hole. Over the following years, additional discoveries showed not only that supermassive black holes exist, but they lurk at the core of every large galaxy, including our own Milky Way. This animation shows a black hole moving through space. As an unsuspecting star gets too close, the black hole's gravity tears it apart. That creates a so-called accretion disk of hot gas and dust rotating rapidly around the black hole. Within the disk, charged particles spin off magnetic fields. They channel some of the inflowing matter out in jets so powerful, they move at nearly the speed of light. The closer you get to a black hole, the higher the temperatures, 10 million or more degrees. As a result, if you want to study the inner parts of the accretion disk, you have to look at high-energy gamma and X-rays. This inner region can be hot and bright enough to shine across the depths of space, becoming a quasar. The brightest and most active quasars are probably consuming matter at a high rate. In this Hubble image, we see a radio jet coming out of the center of the galaxy. Zooming in, we see the accretion disk and a dark central region. Like Sauron in his dark tower, Black holes are known for being terrifying, invisible sources of death and destruction. Black holes are such powerful gravitational monsters that they warp and twist the fabric of space-time. If you get up close, you'd see something like this an accretion disk visible from both above and below. There is an inner ring caused by light that goes all the way around the black hole before escaping and eventually making it to us. It's actually difficult to get close to a black hole. Gas orbiting the event horizon can never actually reach it unless it first sheds its angular momentum. To understand how this can happen, watch a roller skating maneuver in which one skater catapults the other forward. The skater on the inside whips the partner around, transferring angular momentum outwards and slowing down in the process. Around real black holes, it's magnetic fields that sap the angular momentum of the disk, allowing some gas to fall in while throwing the rest out into space. Like rubber bands, these magnetic fields can stretch until the point where they snap, releasing massive amounts of energy and heating the gas to millions or even billions of degrees.
You can see this in the magnetically active corona of our sun, where superheated gas shines very brightly in X-rays. One of the remarkable effects of a black hole's extreme gravity is predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity. It holds that space-time is not only curved, but twisted. In this computer simulation of particles plunging into a black hole, you can see the effect of this twisting right outside of the event horizon where particles are being swept around in a counterclockwise swirl at nearly the speed of light. Taken together, the pulling, twisting and slinging of gas by the black hole leads to ultra-high energy particles and powerful jets. We're just beginning to scratch the surface of what Einstein's theory predicts. Today, the New Star mission is the first telescope to look at the universe in high energy or blue X-rays. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of the nearby galaxy Messier 82, seen in black and white. This is what its warm, dusty regions would look like if you could only see it in the red, orange, and yellow of visible wavelengths. Here, the blue reveals hot regions where stars are actively forming. New Star was able to make high-energy X-ray images of the region around the supermassive black hole in the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. It discovered a hot haze created by a swarm of dead stars. When our universe began, it was a soup of hot hydrogen and helium gas. Thirteen point eight billion years later, we are surrounded by a rich mix of chemical elements, ranging from the nitrogen in the atmosphere to the calcium in your bones. This movie follows the evolution of the universe as portrayed by theorists using supercomputers. Filaments of hydrogen and helium form, shaped by the gravity of dark matter. In these filaments, clouds of dust and gas condense and form stars. The massive ones burn hydrogen and helium, creating progressively heavier elements, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and eventually iron. When these stars run out of nuclear fuel, they can explode in dramatic supernovae. As the universe grew older, countless generations of supernovae spewed chemical elements into the cosmos, where they condensed into galaxies, stars, and planets. How we know all this is, in practice, a dance between theorists and observers with telescopes, including infrared, optical, X-ray, and gamma-ray missions. Huge computational power and theoretical resources 
have gone into understanding the life cycles of stars. Here is a recent attempt to simulate a stellar explosion in a supercomputer. You can see here that the explosion halts. The authors of the experiment then inserted a theoretical sloshing of gas in the central part of the star, setting the supernova in motion. To find out whether this happens in nature, astronomers enlisted X-ray telescopes to take pictures of the remnants of supernova explosions. Here are images of the debris from the historical supernova remnant Cassiopeia. The red and the green images were taken by the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which sees the universe in red and yellow and green colors. New Star has added the blue. This combination gives us a window into the heart of the explosion. These observations suggest that the shape of the explosion was bubbly, consistent with the sloshing mechanism predicted by theorists. Here's Cassiopeia A in all its panchromatic X-ray glory. High-energy telescopes in space are revealing violent events in whole new ways. That includes the most violent of all, a gamma-ray burst with the energy equivalent of 1 to the power of 30 H-bombs. That's one with 30 zeros after it. They're the most energetic explosions in the universe. They occur about once per Earth day and in every part of the sky. In the early days, they were the subject of intense speculation. Aliens in outer space. Alien wars. This was an actual newspaper article. In 1998, an Italian and Dutch satellite discovered that gamma-ray bursts actually originate far outside our own galaxy. That means they must be extremely bright, energetic events. A pair of satellites called Swift and Fermi were launched to study them in detail and to push the frontiers of high-energy astrophysics. To date, they have detected over 1,000 bursts. Every time the Swift or Fermi satellites detect a gamma-ray burst, scientists get a page that sends them running to their computers to view the data. What they have learned is that gamma-ray bursts are generated by supernovae so powerful their cores collapse to a black hole. A small fraction of the matter flowing into the black hole escapes in jets. 
when the jet is aimed at us, we see it as a gamma ray burst. Gamma ray bursts are so intense that they can destroy the atmospheres of nearby planets. We appear to be safe, at least for the time being. Imagine a dark and clear night. Overhead, the Milky Way spreads out across the starry sky. The beauty and grandeur of this portion of our own galaxy beckons us to ask our deepest questions. What is the nature of this marvelous universe? How large is it? How did it come to be? And are we alone in this vast cosmos? Astrophysics the study of the universe and how it works is central to our quest for answers. We are beginning to find them thanks to instruments sent up into space beyond the limiting effects of our atmosphere. High energy missions, Fermi, Swift, New Star and Chandra are uncovering a dynamic universe that is dramatically different from the tranquil tapestry we see with our eyes. They show that the cold, dark reaches of space are punctuated by turbulent forces. Black holes. Cosmic explosions. Bursts of radiation. That violent energy is very much a part of the universe. As we ask once again the great questions, we know that what we see is just the beginning of a story written in the great rumblings of the cosmos. A story that is unfolding still. The universe is going to end. It won't happen for billions of years, but there is no way out. Figuring out how it will end is the challenge of astrophysicists around the world. 
They're pointing high-tech equipment out toward the heavens to unlock the secret of our fate. The possibilities are frightening. In one scenario, gravity pulls the universe back into itself, similar to air being let out of an inflated balloon. The universe goes back to its original size. This is the big crunch. It'll be the end of the universe in a big fireball as all the matter collapses onto itself. That'd be pretty dramatic. Then there's the big chill. The universe expands until the nuclear furnaces that power all the stars burn out. The universe grows cold and dies. A second possibility is actually kind of sad. The universe will continue to expand forever and it will just grow into an increasingly cold and lonely place as the expansion removes our nearest neighbors from us and we just end up a single isolated community of stars and galaxies. Then again, there could be a much more spectacular end in which everything is ripped to shreds down to the last atom. Think of it like a balloon that is filled with too much air. It pops. It's much more dramatic than the big chill and just as fateful as the big crunch. The universe continues to expand, but at an ever quickening pace. And in fact, the pace is so great that even the space-time fabric cannot hold the universe together. However the end comes, it will be a dramatic conclusion. To understand how it all could end, scientists turn to how it began. The mystery starts to be solved here, at the Mount Wilson Observatory overlooking Pasadena, California. In 1929, while looking through what was then the world's largest telescope, Edwin Hubble makes a strange discovery. The universe is expanding. Hubble's discovery led to a whole new picture of the universe, that it was a dynamic environment and that it evolved. It changed in time, and that's different from pictures that people had of cosmology previous to that. Before Hubble, scientists said that the universe was static and unchanging. Hubble's discovery that the universe is expanding meant it had a starting point, a beginning. That brought the idea forward that, hey, what if we ran the film backwards in time and found the point at which that began? The Big Bang. That fraction of a second when the universe and everything in it exploded into existence from a point smaller than an atom. One common misconception about the Big Bang is that we can identify a point in space where the Big Bang occurred. But in fact, it's more appropriate to think of the Big Bang as a simultaneous creation everywhere of space, which is then continuing to expand to the present day. Scientists theorize that at the moment of the Big Bang, the first small particles of matter called quarks were produced. They collided to form the building blocks of the universe, these floated in a thick fog of hot plasma for about 400,000 years. Gravity, also created at the Big Bang, drew the particles together, eventually creating the first stars and lighting up the cosmos. The theory of the Big Bang is a very solid theory. What happened at the moment of the Big Bang is still something we're working on. We don't really understand. If the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang, scientists must consider that it will stop expanding at some point. The question is, how? The most obvious answer involves gravity. What goes up must come down. Stars and galaxies and everything else might reverse direction. The universe would collapse in what some scientists call a big crunch. 
take the top and then see the other handle and just jerk them apart. A model rocket offers clues to how the Big Crunch would work. The rocket is like the universe expanding into space out of the Big Bang. An initial bang allows the rocket to overcome the pull of gravity. Five, four, three, two, one! Eventually, when the fuel is exhausted, the rocket coasts a few feet higher, stops, and is pulled back to Earth. This is what would happen with a big crunch. The entire universe is essentially pulled back to its launch pad. The universe itself has its own momentum, its own energy. It's moving outward. But eventually, there's a point where possibly the universe will stop that moving outward, just like the rocket that we saw, and have to fall back in upon itself and collapse again under the force of its own gravity. In this scenario, the universe could return to its original state just before the Big Bang, setting the stage for a perpetual seesaw of creation and destruction. The Big Crunch theory moved to a scientific back burner. Cosmologists figured out that there must be some form of energy that keeps the universe from collapsing. The existence of such a force leads to new theories about what the universe is made of and how it might end. And evidence about how this might play out is found in some of the most powerful and mysterious phenomena in the cosmos. Black holes. Predicting how the universe will end involves some of the most advanced technology known to man. On a remote volcano on the island of Hawaii, astronomers are monitoring a battle in space that is shaping the fate of the universe. At an elevation of nearly 14,000 feet, the Keck telescopes bring astronomers from all over the world nearer to space for a clearer view of the cosmos. They come here because the telescopes work best far away from city lights and as high as possible above Earth's polluted air. Harsh conditions make it difficult to work here, but for scientists in pursuit of the great mysteries above, it's paradise. So this is a remarkable location. But of course, the air is very thin. It's extremely hard to work here. But these telescopes are amazingly powerful. But we're ambitious astronomers. We don't just stop looking at easy objects. We try hard to look at the very faintest objects so we can understand the extremities of the universe. Here, astronomers like Richard Ellis are working on a problem that has been all-consuming for cosmologists since Edwin Hubble. They know the universe is expanding, but what they don't know is how fast. It will be difficult to predict exactly how the universe will end until they solve this mystery. The answers lie in the past. Now what we were looking, what I did the focus on was a V equals 12. There it is. Yeah. Okay, that's the dry star. We have to get a better focus now. That was worth doing. An astronomer like myself uses a ground-based telescope as a time machine. We're looking back in time to study distant galaxies seen as they were a long, long time ago. One of the distant galaxies that astronomers found revealed a powerful source of X-rays from something that they could not see. It was in the constellation Cygnus and emitted no light, but something was there. Whatever was emitting these X-rays had a mass about seven times that of Earth's sun. There wasn't a name for it, so they called it a black hole. Black holes offer scientists an analogy to how the Big Crunch theory works. When certain stars run out of fuel, they collapse in on themselves into a smaller and far denser mass that attracts more and more matter, just like the Big Crunch. The gravitational pull 
is so powerful that anything that falls near a black hole will be forever trapped. Not even light can escape. It's a mind-boggling concept that something invisible is detectable and offers a view to our ultimate fate. This black tarp represents space, and space is relatively flat. But when you put a massive object into space, it curves it. This is a penny, and notice how it comes into a really beautiful circular orbit. Basically, the black hole trapped it into an orbit around itself, and that orbit becomes very circular as it gets closer. And now the penny will eventually disappear, go inside the black hole. Earth's sun warps space similarly to a black hole, only it's a cosmic wimp by comparison. The gravitational pull of our sun is much weaker. Earth and all its nearby planets are trapped by the sun's pull, but it's so mild that it just stays in orbit without being sucked into the sun. The mass of a black hole can be a million times the mass of the sun, or more, causing a huge warp in the space around it that consumes everything that comes near. That black hole wraps space around itself. And so if material falls near it, it falls inside and gets trapped forever. Black holes exist in isolated areas throughout the cosmos. A black hole's gravitational pull is a scaled down version of the force that could cause the universe to collapse. That force is dark matter. And dark matter is what scientists often call cosmic glue. Hi, Monsieur. Let's do some cosmology here. <laughs> Dark matter uh, attracts other objects via its gravitational attraction. It's a positive force. There's another force that opposes gravity, and that is dark energy. Dark energy, we don't really understand what it is, but it's a negative repulsing effect that pushes galaxies away from each other. The whirlpool in Richard Ellis's demonstration represents the gravitational force of dark matter. The green dye coming out of the syringe shows how the stuff of the universe collapses under the force of dark matter. The presence of dark matter acts as the focus for the gas in the universe, bringing structure together. This is how the Milky Way developed as the universe expanded. Little things merging into big things, the positive constructive force of gravity. Now, if this was the only force in the universe, the universe would stop expanding at some point in the future, and eventually the universe would start collapsing. Gravity would eventually halt the expansion, bring it back together in a big crunch. Yet the universe continues to expand and isn't showing any signs of collapsing. This suggests the opposing force of dark energy could be stronger than dark matter but it will take scientific detective work to find out. They look to one of the most violent forces in the universe for clues. We're studying exploding stars to try to understand if they can tell us the rate at which the universe is expanding. These are explosions at the end of the uh, lives of stars, not unlike our sun. The fuel that these stars have in their centers is, is spent. The star collapses, the outer part expands, and the star becomes something called a white dwarf. White dwarf stars sometimes have other stars orbiting nearby, a companion star. A massive explosion could happen if the companion star's debris falls onto the white dwarf, causing a spectacular fireworks display in the cosmos. Scientists consider exploding stars, or supernovae, like in these images captured by the Hubble telescope, to be reliable telltales of how fast the universe expands. Their brief and bright explosions allow scientists to track the universe's expansion and give them a way to measure its speed. Essentially, they are white dwarf stars that become nuclear bombs. They explode with a certain brightness and a certain length of time. It takes a certain amount of time for that brightness to dissipate. They are essentially standard candles. Any one of these will look the same no matter where it is in the universe. Astronomers measure the distance and speed of these exploding stars by measuring the amount of red light they emit. 
The faster the star moves away from us, the redder its light appears. The expansion rate of galaxies containing stars like supernovae can then be used to interpret how the rest of the universe is moving outward. We know this because we can compare the velocities of galaxies with their distances. These are the clues that lead astronomers to answer just how soon the universe will reverse direction and come back together in a big crunch. Or this information might lead to an entirely different conclusion. Dr. Ellis is looking at clues at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. While the telescope is on the top of a huge volcano, he's in a viewing room on another part of the island. Hey, emission lines, Johan. Oh, you, you see it? In the red, in the red side, I think. At the same time, Johan Richard is at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California, evaluating the light from a distant galaxy that the Keck telescope captured in Hawaii. He's looking to see if any of the known elements coming from the galaxy are in the red spectrum and moving farther away. We can interpret that as a velocity as how much uh, the galaxy is moving away from us. We can really interpret how the entire universe is behaving, is expanding. Interpreting redshift is the cornerstone of the quest to pin down the fate of the universe. Clearer pictures of the universe that have only been possible in recent years have led cosmologists to conclude that the redshift of distant galaxies is greater than predicted. This is startling. Not only is the universe expanding, it's speeding up. Nothing in the observable cosmos could account for an accelerating universe, and yet the data seem irrefutable. This has to mean that an invisible force is working against gravity. Cosmologists have come up with a name, dark energy. So when the universe was young, gravity was the most dominant force. And so what we see here is galaxies as particles on the surface of the water are bound together by gravity. And the point about seven billion years ago, dark energy and gravity are pretty well in balance. But the universe continues to expand, the density goes down, and so dark energy starts to take over. And lo and behold, the universe starts to accelerate. Uh, so dark energy is now the dominant property of space. So the universe started out with a certain amount of energy. And we know we're trying to understand how much energy there is. And we know the universe is expanding as it, as it moves outward with time. We also know now that the universe's expansion is accelerating. And we don't know, is that acceleration going to slow down or not? We're still trying to understand that. So in understanding what's going to happen to the fate of the universe, we have to know how much energy is there, how much matter is there. The history of the universe is really a battle between dark matter and dark energy. Uh, these two forces are in opposition. And so both the history of the universe and its ultimate fate is really the competition between these two forces. The big crunch theory was a result of scientists interpreting that dark matter is the dominant force. But astronomers now suspect that dark energy might be much stronger. If so, the end could be dramatic and violent. It pulls apart solar systems, it pulls apart stars, and eventually it grows so strong that it pulls apart matter itself breaks bonds, pulls apart atoms, and reduces everything to fundamental particles, and that's the end of the universe. The battle between dark matter, the force that holds the universe together, and dark energy, the force seeking to tear it apart, has set the universe on a path of destruction. If dark matter is the victor, the universe might collapse. If dark energy rules the cosmos, it could rip to shreds. The expansion grows so strong that it tears up the entire universe. It'll be a strange twist of fate. Dark energy, the force that propelled matter to form a magnificent universe, continues to push it outward and drives it to its demise. To find out if dark energy is in fact winning the battle, 
scientists will first need to know how fast the universe is actually expanding. The most remarkable feature of the universe is that it's expanding. Every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. When you look out into the night sky, you see distant stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies they observe with telescopes, and they're all moving away from us. We can illustrate that with this balloon. So we expand it. We see that every dot drawn on this black balloon, like the night sky, is moving away from every other dot. But there's something else that we know about the universe, something else that we know about the expansion. That is that the expansion is getting faster. The universe is accelerating. The size of the universe is getting bigger at a faster and faster rate. And we don't know exactly how fast it's accelerating, but if it's accelerating fast enough, then something really dramatic could happen. The universe could end up tearing itself apart in a big rip. This is perfect. This is great that you rigged this up. So this is, this is a giant version of the demo that I do in class. Dr. Robert Caldwell attempts an Earth-bound experiment to show how dark energy affects the acceleration of the universe. He uses a paintball gun mounted on a truck. Yeah, and basically, I mean, we could adjust the angle in any way that you want it. What do you think about yeah, I this? Think, I think down at down the ground, a bit you more. know, is, uh, is the best so we can mark each How's time the, the gun fires. That'll be good. Let's try that. He sends the truck coasting down an incline. Earth's gravity pulls the vehicle downhill, which is similar to how dark energy propels the universe outward, causing it to expand. Gravity pulls the truck forward at an increasing speed. The gun fires paint at the ground at regular one second intervals. Caldwell measures the distance between the paint dots to calculate just how fast the truck was accelerating. He'll use the data from this experiment to see how gravity's force compares to dark energy's force in the cosmos. We started thinking about the Big Rip when it was discovered that the expansion of the universe was accelerating. The degree of acceleration is not known, and it's the subject of a lot of effort by astronomers today to try and figure out exactly how fast the expansion is growing. What is the past evolution of the universe in detail and if we can glean from that, what is the future evolution of the universe? It's not known exactly how fast it's accelerating. There's some evidence that the acceleration is beyond a certain threshold. And beyond that threshold, there's a runaway effect that could take place and it would rip apart the universe. Good luck. Fantastic. I think we've got some uh, good data. Excellent. How do we measure this? Great. Give you that end. All right. I'll take this. Five feet, eight, eight and a half inches. The point of the paintball experiment is to find parallels between the truck propelled by the invisible force of gravity and the accelerating universe. I'm glad we got the long tape measure because it's really growing pretty fast, the interval. Within a few measurements, the distance between the paint spots increases by nearly seven times. If the truck were in space at this rate, it would travel faster than 100 miles per hour within a minute and over 1,000 miles per hour 21. within 10 2. minutes. They're getting big now. Here we got 42 and a half feet. 42, all right, 0.5. The question for Robert Caldwell is whether the same kind of expansion and acceleration are happening on a cosmic scale. What's the uh, the, the capsule made of? Is it plastic or something? Kind of gelatin. Uh huh. It's okay. all biodegradable. Uh huh. So you could actually eat them if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah. This right here is the data that I took with Eric. The cumulative distance traveled by the car as a function of time, and that's beautiful. It's this nice parabolic shape. That's exactly what you expect for an accelerating body. Now over here, I've got another calculation going on where I'm. Uh, working out the acceleration of the universe. Robert Caldwell's calculation shows that forces on Earth are similar to forces in space. This demonstration then 
gives a sense of the dramatic rate of expansion that appears to be happening in the cosmos. By eye, it might be difficult to appreciate how good a fit it is, but uh, I can tell you that the weight of the statistics indicates that an accelerating universe is a very good fit to this data. If, like the truck, the universe is continually accelerating, then billions of years from now, the universe might tear itself apart. All the distant stars and galaxies will be pulled away from, from each other. They'll be pulled away from us. But moreover, we won't have time to grow cold and lonely. It'll actually be pretty exciting and dramatic and violent. Stars are ripped apart, planets are ripped apart, and even atoms are, are torn apart before the universe ends. It wouldn't happen for at least 50 billion years, but still it's an interesting fate for the universe. What would atoms ripping apart look like? Things like coffee cups are solid, Atoms join together to create something that will hold a cappuccino without leaking a single drop. Zoom in through the cup, like sailing through the cosmos, past the molecules and into the atoms. The solid cup is nothing more than a fabric of atomic particles that formed a bond to become matter. If these particles were to move apart, the bonds that hold this cup together stop working. The atoms no longer support molecules. The connections between the minuscule particles dissolve. Matter in the form of this cup ceases to exist. It disintegrates, gone from existence. This is the dramatic end that Robert Caldwell foresees for the universe. What you would see if you were standing on Earth or standing on some other planet that uh, happened to still be around at that time, you would see something that looks like a wall of darkness approaching you. And as the wall of darkness approaches, uh, stars would go out, galaxies would go out, and then eventually uh, that wall of darkness would surround the planet. And then pretty soon, atoms themselves are torn apart, and that's it. Just the wall of darkness shrinks down to a point, and that's the end of the universe. According to Robert Caldwell, that moment is still billions of years off, leaving plenty of time to refine the research. In a way, this is like a detective story. We're trying to figure out what is the culprit or who is the culprit responsible for the cosmic acceleration. We think we know its name. We call it dark energy, but we don't know the modus operandi. We don't know exactly how it works. And what's needed is more information, more information about the physics behind the dark energy. We want to know exactly what it does and exactly what it's made out of. And in answering those questions, we'll be able to figure out exactly what is the fate of the universe? The Big Rip is one theory. Cruising just above Earth's atmosphere and peering deep into space, the Hubble telescope provides scientists with clues to a less violent, but equally unavoidable, end of the universe. Scientists now say the universe is expanding and that depending on how fast it is accelerating, it might end in a big rip where everything tears apart. It's also possible that it will continue to expand, but at a slower rate. The universe wouldn't rip apart, but would become dark, cold, and lifeless. If dark energy turns out to be constant, a constant property of space, and continues at the same rate that it is now, the universe will keep expanding forever, and it will be a very sad state, I think. In the end, it just chills out. Everything cools down. Evidence for the big chill, and all of the theories for the end of the universe, in part, come from the Hubble Space Telescope. It has been orbiting Earth since 1990, and has an unobstructed view of the cosmos. The extraordinary images it beams back to Earth are amazing in their clarity and detail. And because of Hubble, scientists can make better predictions about how the universe will end. 
So here is an example of a, a very deep field that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which literally you point the space telescope at a single region uh, in space. And if you looked at this from a typical uh, ground-based image before Hubble was launched, first of all, it's, it's a, literally a, almost size of a postage stamp. And so suddenly, the first Hubble Deep Field that was ever taken had 4,000 galaxies that looked just like the galaxies here that were never visible before from the ground. A tremendous power. Each of these smudges in their own right um, is another galaxy. Each one of these galaxies contains about 100 billion stars. Hubble sees more than just stars and galaxies. It just might be on to one of the key ingredients of space, an invisible ingredient that could put the brakes on dark energy's effect and cause a big chill. That's dark matter. Scientists talk about dark matter as the substance that holds the universe together and could prevent a big rip. Evidence that dark matter exists is seen in some of Hubble's images of nearby galaxies. It sometimes appears as though other galaxies surround them. The other galaxies are not really there at all. Rather, they are reflections of more distant galaxies coming from behind. Astronomers suspect this optical illusion is dark matter causing a weird distortion of light called gravitational lensing. The light from the more distant galaxies is literally bent by the curvature of space caused by stars and dark matter in its path. The more dark matter there is between Earth and the distant galaxy, the more the light will be bent and the greater the force to cause a big chill. The gravitational lensing is a tremendous tool for the astronomer because we can measure the distortion in background galaxies and use it to trace the distribution of dark matter on various scales. We're looking at a distribution of idealized galaxies here on the sky, and the light from these distant galaxies is passing through clumps of dark matter. What you look at is not really what's happening. Uh, it's a bit like wearing spectacles and not knowing that you're wearing them. And if you can tell how much that bending is occurring, you can map the dark matter, and you can also see, well, if there's dark matter there, is the universe around that dark matter behaving the way it should given the gravity or not. If it's slightly gravitating less, then dark energy might be changing in those places. Identifying which energy force dominates, dark matter or dark energy, will give scientists more confidence about whether a big chill or a big rip will be our fate. The best evidence shows dark energy as the driving force, but by how much? Solving this mystery depends on astronomers finding ways to measure how fast the universe is moving. On Earth, it's simple to determine how fast something moves. An airplane, for example, is relatively close. We can look at it and calculate its speed by estimating the distance it travels and timing how long it takes to get from one point to another. But a star's light can travel for millions or billions of years before it can be seen on Earth. By the time its light gets here, the star will be long gone, and it's too far away to gauge its speed or distance traveled with any certainty. The universe is expanding, only scientists cannot give precise answers about how fast. The mystery moves closer to being solved by imaging the cosmos with greater precision. Clearer images from space make it easier to estimate the rate of expansion. If the universe continues to expand with time, then ultimately all of the energy sources, the nuclear furnaces and stars, would run out and die, and the universe would actually get very cold, and there'd be something called a big chill. In the big chill scenario, Earth could become a lonely, cold planet as the universe expands. Distances between stars grow so vast that they nearly disappear from view. Over time, they burn out, and eventually the entire universe ends in a frozen state. This sphere demonstrates the principles behind a big chill. The marbles coming out of the sphere 
are like stars that were formed following the Big Bang. Dark energy propels the stars outward. Dark matter slows them down. In a big chill, the expansion would continue, but the nuclear fuel that causes the stars to burn will eventually run out. From Earth's perspective, the first thing to go would be sunlight. The sun dims as it exhausts its last bits of nuclear fuel. Earth would freeze and become lifeless. And billions of years after humans are gone, the cosmos expands out of view. A few newer stars might remain, but most would have long moved away. The furnace powering the universe burns out. The darkened universe continues to expand, a frozen and lifeless remnant of its once vibrant existence. Eventually, if this keeps going, if, if nothing changes in the, in the composition of this energy density, the universe will continue to expand forever. It's going to get colder and colder. And eventually, even the gal our neighboring galaxies will be receding from us so fast that we won't be able to see them. So the universe is going to get cold and dark, and, uh, and it will be a very lonely place. Astronomers have much to learn about the influence of dark energy and dark matter. And much of the newest information is coming from this probe in deep space. It's sending back information that's helping scientists to interpret the history and the fate of the universe. The night sky, by all appearance, is a quiet and peaceful place. But in reality, there are forces that are driving it to an end. Big science moves astronomers closer to deciphering the universe's great mysteries, including its ultimate fate. The solution to the universe's riddle may well be hidden in this multicolored image. What's incredible is that it's a map of the early universe from the moment it was conceived. And even more fantastic, it reveals a great story that helps cosmologists predict how it will end. The machine that captured this is called WMAP, a NASA satellite that's working around the clock to chart the cosmos. What we're looking at here is the edge of the visible universe. It's the light that WMAP measured, left, it's the remnant heat from the Big Bang, and this is literally the oldest light in the universe that we can see. This fossil relic from the early universe tells us a great deal about what the composition of matter was like, what the expansion rate was like, and really what the conditions were at the birth of our universe. WMAP is one of the great astronomical breakthroughs of the 21st century. Nothing before could give us such a clear image of the energy left over from the Big Bang. Energy that scientists call the cosmic microwave background. WMAP is measuring temperature differences in the cosmic microwave background, which may finally make it possible to predict which force will dominate the universe and how that force will bring the cosmos to its end. The blue spots are regions in the uh, microwave light that was produced by the Big Bang that are slightly colder than the average temperature, and the red spots are regions that are slightly hotter than the average. Temperature differences revealed by WMAP tell scientists about the nature of the matter and energy that is contained within the universe. They're able to analyze the light patterns and find clues not only about the substance, but also the fate of the universe. We only capture a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum with our eyes, and we have to go to much longer wavelengths. The same wavelengths that are used to heat water in a microwave oven are what we're measuring here with WMAP. WMAP is so precise that it can detect differences in temperatures as small as one one-thousandth of a degree. 
This sensitivity helps scientists to calculate the ratio of dark matter to dark energy, forces that will determine how the universe ends. We assemble all those difference measurements and, and make a map of what the variations look like. And by turning up the, uh, the contrast, we can, we can basically subtract off this uniform glow from the Big Bang and look for a variation. It doesn't look like much until Gary Hinshaw adjusts the contrast. Then the WMAP image comes to life. Looking at WMAP imagery is in essence taking a journey back through space and time so that we might get some new ideas on the fate of the universe. Pulling away from the probe and following the path of the light it is collecting, we pass Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, whose reflected light takes over an hour to reach Earth. Then, leaving the Milky Way, we pass Andromeda, the next nearest galaxy, whose light takes 2.3 million years to reach us, which means we have traveled 2.3 million years back in time. Finally, we arrive back 13 billion years ago, at the beginning of visible light. Before that, superheated hydrogen gas is everywhere. WMAP can see this far back in history. It's confirming important facts about the universe and what's driving it to its demise. The final act for the universe becomes more easily predicted thanks to WMAP. Its information, combined with the work of astronomers, has led to some astounding discoveries concerning a rapidly expanding universe. Rapid expansion supports the dark energy theory and the possibility of a big chill or big rip. We now know from all the data we've had in the last 10 years that there's, by a factor of two to one, more dark energy than dark matter. So dark energy is the dominant constituent of uh, energy in the universe. The evidence seems clear. Dark energy is taking over and is leading astronomers into new thoughts about the beginning and the end of the universe. Before the discovery of dark energy, things were a lot simpler. If we could determine the amount of matter in the universe, then we could say something about its ultimate destiny. Those simple days are gone, but the proof is adding up and supports the idea that the universe will continue to expand. But will it do so to oblivion? We've made huge strides over the last century in learning something about the evolution of the universe and its expansion. But we've now raised more questions in some sense than we've been able to answer. And so I think the next decade is going to be even more exciting. Astronomers have tons and tons of challenges that have been thrown our way by theorists. And we are rapidly trying to figure out how to answer all of these questions. And I think that's the exciting future, because if you, if you can go out and really observe something, you're testing it. And that's what science is all about. The battle between dark matter and dark energy is expected to go on for billions of years. And humans will be long gone from Earth when the final outcome occurs. But no pursuit has been more significant to science than understanding how the universe arrived, how it works, and how it will end. It's a never-ending quest. It's driving astronomy. What are the answers to these profound questions? The constituents of the universe, the nature of dark matter, and perhaps the biggest mystery of all, what is the ultimate fate of the universe? Twenty seventeen was a busy year for scientists of all sorts, the professional and the enthusiast alike. From a predictable astronomical rarity to surprise discoveries deep underground, it was a year that saw long held beliefs challenged by newly found wonders, breakthroughs that led to innovations. 
and a glimpse 130 million years into the past. In August 2017, alarms sounded at the most sensitive scientific devices ever constructed. In Washington State, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, detected faint disturbances from deep space. The signal also hit LIGO's sister facility in Louisiana. Gravitational waves had reached Earth. Gravitational waves are ripples in space-time. Space-time is incredibly dense. So to cause ripples, you have to have some sort of object that has an enormous gravity, like a black hole or a neutron star. And when these objects are uh, rapidly accelerating, they bend space-time and create these ripples that then travel through the universe to our detectors on Earth. Like the one last August. On high alert, the LIGO team quickly reached out to Virgo, its European counterpart in Italy, who confirmed that they too had detected gravitational waves. And then, as if by destiny, the stars would align once more to pave the way to a groundbreaking discovery. Just two seconds later, with the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, we detected a short, bright flash of high energy light that we call a gamma ray burst. This alerted the entire astronomical community to the fact that something very exciting was happening. Using data collected from LIGO, Virgo, and Fermi, 70 ground and space-based telescopes scoured the edge of galaxy NGC 4993, some 130 million light years away from Earth, searching for a small flash of light amidst a sea of stars. It would take less than 12 hours after the alarms rang at LIGO for Earth to have visual confirmation of a never-before-seen astronomical event. What we saw was the result of the merging of two neutron stars. When they merged, they created an explosion in space-time. Those ripples went out across the universe as gravitational waves and were detected on Earth. The matter involved gave off gamma rays and other forms of light. Neutron stars are the collapsed cores of massive stars left behind after a supernova explosion. No larger than a mid-sized city, these dense stars have 10 to 60% more mass than our sun. This pair of stars, 200 miles apart, were locked in each other's orbit for over 11 billion years. But as they started accelerating and moving inwards, their orbit quickened from 30 times a second to an astonishing and unsustainable 2,000 orbits a second. Then, 130 million years ago, they collided in a resounding explosion. Peering into the past, telescopes were able to see the remnants of one of the universe's most impressive firework shows. A bright flash of blue followed the initial explosion, growing redder and duller as the days passed, until eventually fading to black. The conditions around these merging neutron stars have densities and temperatures completely unlike anything we can do on Earth. The violent explosion was observed to have produced 200 Earth masses worth of gold and 500 Earth masses of platinum, revealing for the first time the origins of heavy metals in our galaxy. We think that all the gold in the universe was formed in explosions of this kind. After the explosion happens, the gold is spread out into the gas and dust of the interstellar medium. Later on, that gas and dust collapses into brand new stars and brand new planetary systems. And these weren't the first gravitational waves detected by LIGO this year. Two separate events have been measured before, including a pair of monstrous black holes that collided to form a single spinning hole, 53 times more massive than the sun. We received a perfect signal from this last merger. It traveled three billion light years to get here. In any given galaxy, one of these events might only happen once every million years but we're now able to monitor about 10 million galaxies at a time. 
It's a new type of astronomy. But while we wait for gravitational waves that can open a window on the origins of our universe, volcanic activity off the coast of Japan is presenting scientists with a picture of Earth's early history, when land first rose from the seas. Violent eruptions spew a steady stream of lava and rocks, expanding the newly emerged island of Nishinoshima, three square kilometers, in just five short months this year. These most recent blasts stopped in August, but could resume at any time. Situated atop the junction of four tectonic plates, the Japanese islands offer stunning insights about the formation of a variety of landscapes. Analysis of Nishinoshima's magma shows it to be andesitic, similar to the composition of continental crust. Monitoring the growth of Nishinoshima, geologists hope to learn more about the forces that led to the birth of the world's eight continents. Yes, not seven, eight. In February 2017, the Geological Society of America published a startling paper. Zealandia, Earth's hidden continent. Geologist Nick Mortimer was the lead author. To discover Zealandia is to change the map of the world, quite literally. Uh, beforehand, most people would say, yes, we've got seven continents, they could count them off. But now the world map's changed and we've got an eighth one on there. In the beginning, there was no search for Zealandia. Mortimer and his team discovered the shallow submerged continent while performing geological work aboard a research vessel off of New Zealand's coast. And so what the various geological investigations have led us to is that uh, we do have the, the components of a continent here. When you pull a plug on the world's oceans, you literally reveal the continent of Zealandia. Mortimer and his team confirmed four geological markers the qualifying criteria for a continent. Height, a varied geology or diversity of rock types, a thick crust, and ultimately size. Is it big enough? Corroborating data include rock samples, ocean drill cores, and satellite microgravity measurements translated into bathymetric or elevation maps of the seafloor. Situated between the Pacific Plate and the Australian Plate, tectonic forces squeezed Zealandia, raising out of the water what we know today as New Zealand. With 94% of Zealandia underwater, the islands of New Zealand and New Caledonia are just the tip of this continental iceberg. And measuring in at 4.9 million square kilometers, Zealandia is six times bigger than the so-called microcontinent of Madagascar, and more than twice as large as Greenland, which also happens to be attached to North America. To understand Zealandia's origins, we must travel back in time to the time of the supercontinent Gondwana, comprised of what we know today as Africa, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. When Gondwana split apart 80 million years ago, it was a bit like the stretching of bread dough in a kitchen. And then you start to pull that big lump of dough apart. And if, if you pull slowly, some of those pieces will stretch and get thinner. Just like Zealandia, which broke off and slowly sank because of its relatively thin continental crust. It's not as thick as the main continents, but it is thicker than the ocean crust. And geophysicists know that when you have thin crust, it floats lower in the mantle, and so it, it sits lower elevation-wise, and, and that explains in very simple terms why Zealandia is so submerged. 
Now that we've got Zealandia in the, in the scientific arena, we, we do hope to consolidate it and to promote Zealandia in New Zealand schools, first of all, and we hope to get it in atlases, on globes. We hope that Zealandia will become as, as common and well-known as, as any of the other major continents. Of course, the initial buzz about Zealandia can only help its name recognition. The notion that something so big and so important could be hidden for so long um, I think uh, captured people's imagination. Out of sight, out of mind, no more. Of course, not everything that's undetected is so obviously obscured. And one remarkable discovery this year offers clues about how some prehistoric creatures could hide in plain sight. In northern Alberta, Canada, the remnants of a 110 million year old dinosaur from the late Mesozoic era is providing the world with an unprecedented look at a new species, the Notosaur. A fossil so pristine and complete that it shows the texture, patterns, and color of a prehistoric giant. The Notosaur is the best specimen we have, and it's the closest you'll come until we find a better one in terms of coming face to face with a dinosaur. The notosaur is next to Surreal, a petrified beast caught by Medusa's gaze. We knew it was good, but we didn't know how good it was. I think it's the best preserved armored dinosaur in the world. I'm calling this the Rosetta Stone for armored dinosaurs. The anatomy of the new species has already given scientists clues to how these animals evolved, how they radiated and diversified through time. And it doesn't stop there. The skin is preserved. It's not just the impression of the skin. We actually have some of the original biomolecules preserved. One of the cool things that they tell us for this specimen is that the animal had at least a component of, of reddish brown pigment to its skin. The coloration aspect is very exciting, so it's, it's cool to know what color it was, but it's, it's actually more exciting when that has some implications for how the animal lived. Researchers believe the notosaur was darker on the back and lighter on its sides and underside, a method of camouflage called countershading. Now keep in mind, this was a, a five, five and a half meter long, ten and a half animal covered in armor but it still has camouflage. And to us, that just illustrates how intense the predation was back in the Cretaceous. You had these very large meat-eating dinosaurs, and they would have also been very visual predators. So it actually kind of just shows you how extreme that ecosystem likely was back in the Cretaceous. The plant-eating, slow-moving beast only stood a chance because of its impenetrable coat of armor. We see three rows of osteoderms. Those are what are called cervical rings, and it's armor that would have protected the neck of the animal. And as we move to the side, we see this giant periscapular spine. It's basically a big armor spine coming off the shoulder, and it's about half a meter long. And the spectacular specimen still has many secrets to unveil. The next focus of study are the contents of the notosaur's stomach. In addition to having skin preserved all over most of the surface of the animal, we also have abundant uh, gut contents, so the, the last meal of the animal preserved inside. And uh, this is what that stuff looks like. So we're currently doing all sorts of work on this, uh, geochemical work, histological work, and CT scanning, trying to figure out what these spheroid structures are and there's been many ideas that part of the diversification of dinosaurs is tied to the diversification of flowering plants and it would be great to see exactly which types of plants this guy was eating and if that hypothesis makes sense. We know what dinosaurs ate, how they fought, and now what they looked like. But there are still many questions to be answered. And Alberta might just be the place to find them. It's estimated that there are thousands of fossils hidden underneath the earth. 
But when a six-mile-wide asteroid struck the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, dinosaurs had nowhere to hide. And the resulting global cataclysm of earthquakes, firestorms, and tsunamis ultimately led to their extinction. Some animals, however, managed to survive. But how? Since its discovery in 1978, investigations of the asteroid's impact crater include data from seismic images and recently collected core samples from deep within the site at Chicxulú. The data paints a devastating picture of destruction and led scientists to create a broad new survival theory, focusing on habitat and diet adaptability. When dinosaurs perished and a vast new ecospace emerged, the surviving species expanded rapidly to fill it. This is called adaptive radiation. A recent study shows that one out of 10 frog species descend from the original three frog species that survived the Cretaceous tertiary extinction event. Frogs were able to escape extinction for a number of reasons. They live in an aquatic habitat that offered protection. Their small size and unique metabolism allow for better endurance of environmental stress. Eventually, when vegetation returned, they were able to diversify worldwide and adapt to new lives in trees. Birds, too, exhibited the same adaptive radiation around the same time. A newly found 62 million year old mouse bird fossil in New Mexico helped paleontologists map the diversification of land birds, which can be traced back to nine original ancestors, which survived the event. Warm-blooded, birds' feathers insulated them from temperature extremes. Their small size and ability to fly allowed for easier escape from hostile and barren terrain. And their diet of seeds, worms, and insects gave them the edge after much of the Earth's surface plant life had died. In the end, the ability to adapt to changing conditions proved a key characteristic for the survival of many ancient animals, including our smallest mammal ancestors. Just as it may be for humans today, as we confront the challenges of climate change, The city of Miami Beach already knows what it means to wade through sea level rise. In recent years, residents have experienced elevated high tides at certain times of the year. Known as king tides, these events are clear evidence of incremental increases. Right now, we are definitely witnessing uh, sea level rise impacts, these high tide flooding events that are growing in severity more often deeper, more widespread. That's sort of a, a pattern that we expect will continue. That means huge financial costs by the year 2100. Another predicts two and a half million Miamians could become sea level refugees and leave the area. It's not only Miami. All around the world, sea levels are expected to rise. The question is, by how much? In adopting a multi-pronged approach, Miami Beach has committed 400 to 500 million dollars to combat sea level rise, building water pumps and raising their defenses. With the continued issue of climate change and sea level rise, we're seeing a increase of water level every year. We had to make changes to adapt to this future condition. What you're seeing here, we put a boardwalk initially to give some height, but we found that that wasn't protecting the city. What we've done here is we've increased the levels of our new seawall. The new wall you see in the background here is our new standards. 
This was good for approximately another 50 years, and we're gonna see water levels challenging even that new seawall. Raising its elevation, Miami Beach seeks to stay dry and take control of its future. The city's philosophy, our culture, is rising above. We believe we can meet the challenge. And the challenge is not only in rising above, meaning elevation. It's rising to and, and withstanding the challenges that have come with sea level rise due to climate change. As a city engineer, I have complete faith that we can win. We can mitigate. We can survive. Of course, the Earth's oceans have risen and fallen many times during the planet's history. And new archaeological evidence suggests these shifting shorelines may conceal clues about the earliest Americans. Until just recently, archaeologists generally agreed that the earliest people to populate North America were the Clovis people, dating back to some 12 to 13,000 years ago. But a group of scientists in San Diego, California, have a different theory. We have the bones, the fossils, the, the distribution, the rocks, the date. We have evidence for humans in North America 130,000 years ago. We realize that that is a startling claim. But the scientific community is struggling with the idea that humans arrived in North America 130,000 years ago. The study of early humans in the New World has been very political and very controversial for over 125 years. It's an old mystery yet to be solved, deciding who got to North America first and when. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning at the San Diego Natural History Museum as we share some exciting news about our discovery made right here in San Diego. Well, back in 1992, Caltrans was um, doing improvements to um, State Route 54, which involved adding a couple new travel lanes. And um, Richard Cerruti, who's a field paleontologist here at the museum, was monitoring the excavations on the very north side of the freeway alignment and saw this little puff of, of let's say, tusk material being scraped up by an excavator and said, stop, let's, let me go look at this. The bones that Richard Cerruti found belong to an ancient mastodon. That's one tooth, so and it's characteristic of American mastodon. Were these giants sharing North America with early man 130,000 years ago? The answer may lie in the position of the bones and tools found at the site. There are anomalous fragments of rock, anomalous fragments of tooth enamel scattered throughout the site that just don't make sense. Could these stones amongst ancient bone remnants have been an early form of primitive tools? And we felt that it was important to produce a map where we carefully plotted or precisely plotted the position of all the bones and the stones or whatever else is in there so that we can understand what the general pattern is. It's thought that the tools found with the mastodon bones were used for butchering the animal. So this is one of the cobbles that we hypothesized was used as a hammer stone. 130,000 years ago where, where there was a, a carcass of a mastodon, um, these people were trying to recover raw materials from it. They had a problem, how do, how do we break these bones? They look over into the active river channel, find some cobbles, of the appropriate size and weight, bring them back to the site. And if you look closely, there's some striations coming off of that that are indication, indications of where this flake has come off. The cuts in this rock led the San Diego team to conclude that these were actually tools used by humans. An idea that Demir says might not be so far-fetched. Dr. Stephen Holen, is co-director of the Center for American Paleolithic Research in South Dakota. He was part of the team that evaluated the findings from the San Diego excavation site. So what do we got in here, Steve? Looks like vertebra. Ver that does. And I said, I can't get my mind around this. This site has to be really, really old. But yep, here's evidence of humans. I said, it goes against everything I thought I knew and everything I have ever been taught. 
Poland evaluated the mastodon bones and the stone tools recovered from the excavation site. We would take the drawers out of the cabinets in here and bring them in on this table and look through them, paleontologists and archaeologists together. Uh, Richard Cerruti came in, so there were four of us, my wife Kathleen, Tom, and I, and we would look through and we would look for these very diagnostic pieces. And one of the things that we got all excited about first were these cone flakes that form in a circle around the point of impact from the hammerstone. And based on the experiment that we'd done in Africa, breaking an elephant femur with a big hammer, uh, we saw the same kinds of fracture patterns that we did experimentally. Poland specializes in evaluating broken bones at archaeological sites, looking for human causes. As this video shows from a test he conducted in Africa two years prior to working on the San Diego project. Oh my God. As we puzzled over this, we kept coming back to this one explanation that explains all the data was that humans did this. The detective work by the San Diego Natural History Museum team was capped by the age dating that Richard Cerruti had done to prove the age of the mastodon bones he discovered. This is one of the specimens that he used in his analysis. He cored it and he also sliced it. And after analyzing over 100 uh, micro samples from this specimen and, and two other specimens of bone from the site uh, yielded an age of 130,000 plus or minus 9,000. So after the article came out, there has been no critic come out to say that the dating is incorrect. In fact, other specialists in uranium series dating have come out and said the dates look perfectly good. So we're very comfortable with the dates. While humans' arrival in the Americas may have occurred earlier than previously thought, New dating of another paleontological find found in a South African cave could soon upend long-held theories about the evolutionary tree of primates and early humans. When we actually got into the chamber and could start removing it, we realized that not only was there one individual lying there on the surface, but the floor was literally comprised of Homo naledi. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of remains down in those chambers. And all you have to do is sweep the surface off, and there they are. So the first time I, I sort of slid through that hallway and into the open area where the chamber is, and sort of started looking around, you know, you're only wearing a headlamp, so you just see flashes. But every flash of my headlamp showed bone. So I think right at that point, I realized that we had a lot more than the pho original photographs actually had portrayed. So that was pretty exciting. Elmanale isn't really similar to any known hominid species in its entirety of its package. You've got little bits and pieces of almost everything we've ever found. Parts of the skull, if you just look at it quickly, look a little bit like Homo erectus. Got a very small brain. Other parts of the skull look very modern, like Homo sapiens. It gets stranger and stranger as you move down the body. You get the ape-like shoulders. You get these more and more human-like arms, which end with a hand that's human proportion. I was actually at the uh, London Natural History Museum, and uh, Omen Naledi was on the wall, and then there was estimated age between 1.2 and 1.8 million years. But then, when we actually did the scientific dating of those teeth, this is when things got very interesting because then we got an age uh, of 200 to 300,000 years old. When we got a date as much younger than that, a quarter of a million years, give or take, we realized that we were dealing with a primitive creature, almost like a time traveler, that had come down from deep times to a point where it is very possible that Tomonale was in direct contact with uh, the emergence of modern humans. We never thought that was possible in Africa. Until this moment, we thought that there was effectively, during that entire time period of the Middle Pleistocene, late Middle Pleistocene, one form, a big-brained form of Homo sapiens. Now there are two, and that adds incredible complexity to our record. The world of Homo naledi and other early humans was different than it is today a veritable Garden of Eden, teeming with life, pure and free from pollution. Few places like this still exist, and most of them quite remote. 
But look just a few feet underwater and you can find one of the most productive and overlooked ecosystems on Earth. Scientists recently learned that seagrass meadows help scrub the surrounding water clean of bacteria from raw sewage and other pathogens. A recent study of polluted waters in Indonesia showed levels of harmful bacteria to be 50% less in spots with robust seagrass beds, leading to healthier fish and coral in the surrounding area. You see, seagrasses oxygenate the water, trap sediment that might otherwise float freely, and host tiny microbes that kill many harmful bacteria. Eliminating toxins improves the health of any system, and the workings of a human body is no different. In athletics, though, they say no pain, no gain. A nod to the physical effort required to increase endurance and enjoy the health benefits of exercise. But new pharmaceutical research also aims to make those benefits more easily accessible. The potential benefit of a drug that can tune you up in the way in which you normally get tuned up by exercise could have really dramatic effects. Playfully known as the exercise pill, the experimental drug shifts metabolism by triggering genetic instructions for the body to burn fat instead of sugar during exercise, something that doesn't normally happen until after extensive training and conditioning. Recent tests increase the endurance of otherwise sedentary mice, which also proved to be resistant to weight gain while on the drug. We have two groups of mice and um, one group on uh, the drug, the other group as a control without the treatment of the drug. So we were quite uh, surprised to see the astonishing results. The mice treated with the drug, they can run almost 100 minutes longer than the one that are not treated. The increase was around uh, 70%. Researchers ultimately hope their product can improve the health of the disabled, elderly, and obese. There are many reasons why people can't either walk or run or exercise. And the idea is if you can bring a small molecule into the picture that can confer the benefits of fitness without training, you could really help a lot of people. From energizing our bodies to powering societies. So we are just waiting for the next experiment. It's going to happen in 10 seconds. There you go. You see the flickering of the plasma? We are creating fusion here. This is our little sun. It's extremely hot. Each day, every 20 minutes, researchers build the sun at the Cullum Fusion Center in Oxfordshire, Britain. Generating temperatures greater than 200 million degrees, these nuclear fusion trials would be impossible without JET, the Joint European Taurus, a donut-shaped plasma containment vessel. At this point, we're the most important experiment in the world. Thanks to JET, where energy is created by combining hydrogen atoms, Right. There's heavy hydrogen, which we call deuterium, and the super heavy hydrogen, which we call tritium. And when they're running around at these temperatures, like 200 million degrees, they bang into each other with immense speed. And when they do, and they get close enough, what we call the strong force, which binds the nucleus of atoms together, grips them, pulls them together, and they fuse, and they make helium, and they spit out a neutron. Fusion really is the perfect way to make energy. And yet, despite fusion's transformative potential to provide safe and sustainable energy to the world, the program faces an uncertain future. While the British government committed to pay for its share of the experiments up to the year 2020, Brexit, its planned departure from the European Union, may also lead to the UK's withdrawal from scientific agencies like Euratom the European Atomic Energy Community. Some say this could jeopardize jet logistics and operations, and perhaps also the larger next-generation fusion experiment. 
currently being built in southern France. If fusion represents harnessing the physical power of the sun, a moment of darkness reflected its emotional power. An awe-induced euphoria experienced by millions as the first total solar eclipse over North America in three decades made its way across the United States. It's the most unnatural, natural phenomenon I ever saw. This is a solar eclipse. And just what people witnessed on August 21st, along a 70-mile wide path. First, along the Oregon coast at 10.15 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And last, in South Carolina, 94 minutes later. The uncommon coupling was the most viewed and photographed eclipse ever recorded. And yet, even as the sun re-emerged from the moon's shadow, some earthly domains remained, as always, far removed from its rays. Like the cave chambers, 300 meters below Mexico's Nica mine, enormous razor-sharp crystals dwarf human explorers. While today the cave is totally submerged, previous expeditions collected bizarre life forms from these crystal giants. They call this place Hell on Earth. Temperatures climb to 135 degrees Fahrenheit with over 80% humidity. Even with life-saving bodysuits, no visit can safely last longer than a half hour. Yet deep within this extreme environment are life forms which exist nowhere else, known as extremophiles. NASA astrobiologist Penny Boston and her team found 40 strains of mineral-eating organisms. Trapped within the crystals here, they collected sample microbes, some dormant but alive. Estimated to be between 10 and 50,000 years old, including genetically unique and previously undiscovered life forms. Any extremophile system that we're studying actually, you know, allows us to push the envelope of life further. And we add it to this atlas of possibilities that we can apply to different uh, planetary settings. By expanding the definitions of life on Earth and where to find it. Boston's findings could impact the search for life beyond our planet. On places like the protoplanet Ceres, the largest object located within the solar system's asteroid belt, and one of the scientific targets of NASA's Dawn space probe. And in February of 2017, startling and unexpected news began coming in. My colleague found a spectral signature in her data that is consistent with, or the same signature of, of aliphatic hydrocarbons. So here we're finding maybe the building blocks of, of biological material. Seen here in red, the organic materials are thought to have originated in the dwarf planet itself. Dawn's study of Ceres also revealed evidence of water and volcanic activity, further raising the scientific profile of Ceres, no longer considered a barren rock. However, Dawn isn't the only NASA spacecraft uncovering new surprises about our solar system. Seven months after arriving in Jupiter's planetary system, the Juno Explorer became fully operational in February of 2017. Astonishing researchers with the steady stream of images and scientific data it's sending back to Earth.
Jupiter is by far the largest planet in our solar system, leaving Juno with a whole lot of ground to cover. And although it is the second brightest planet in our night sky, its formation and composition have left us in the dark. Previous NASA missions have given us some understandings of its moons, small dust rings, and atmosphere. But we've not been able to see past the Van Gogh-like swirls of dense red, brown, yellow, and white clouds that paint the planet. At least, not until now. Each individual image is awe-inspiring, especially those captured when Juno came within 5,000 miles of Jupiter's great red spot, the planet's most famous storm. Pouring over data from Juno's microwave radiometer, scientists hope to learn more about what powers the tempest and how it differs from other Jovian storms. This critical instrument measures six distinct ranges of thermal radiation as it peers more than 300 miles beneath Jupiter's clouds to create a three-dimensional model of Jupiter's atmospheric environment. So the first time we're looking inside of Jupiter with the into the interior, and what we're seeing is that it doesn't work at all like we had predicted. Almost every model that has the interior motion, how the magnetic field, the gravity field, how the deep atmosphere works, it's all different. Current modeling estimates that the cloud cover is roughly 30 miles thick. Below it, there lies a 13,000 mile layer of swirling hydrogen and helium that changes states from gas to liquid as it nears the center leading to a 24,000 mile deep sea of metallic hydrogen. If we can probe it and work out the abundance of elements in it, uh, hydrogen, helium, the higher elements as well, and work out roughly what that mix is, it'll tell us something about not only how Jupiter was formed, but how the solar system might form. If there is a bunch of rocky material in the center of Jupiter, it means that the, in the early solar system, before Jupiter formed, that rocky substances were probably coming together and Jupiter got built around those. It could be that Jupiter was built without any of those and that it just collapsed sort of like the sun and there is no rocky material or, or core of heavy elements in the center. Strangely though, gravity data collected so far points to a new possibility a somewhat larger than previously thought and perhaps partially dissolved core, leaving Jupiter experts with more questions than answers. We're putting the pieces of the puzzle together and it's exciting, but we don't have the, the whole picture yet. Juno's primary mission is scheduled to continue until February 2018. But this past year, NASA saw another of its extraordinary explorers come to the end. And uh, we are in the atmosphere. As the Cassini space probe plummeted into Saturn's atmosphere in a fiery death spiral. Roughly one minute to loss of signal. The culmination of the craft's revolutionary scientific quest. Call loss of signal at 115546. The signal from the spacecraft is gone. Congratulations to you all. This has been an incredible spacecraft, and you're all an incredible team. She has rewritten the textbooks about Saturn, the rings, the moons, Titan. So many things have changed because of Cassini. From its launch 20 years ago to its bold grand finale, the Cassini-Huygens mission has unveiled some amazing discoveries. Saturn is ablaze with storms of unimaginable force. The place crackled with giant lightning strikes. The rings are even more dazzling than imagined, stretching across hundreds of thousands of miles. They're made of particles of pure water ice some microscopic, some the size of mountains. They break apart and they reform, so there's this beautiful cosmic dance going on inside the rings.
Cassini also carried a little lander called Huygens, which became the first probe to land on a moon other than our own. Its target, Titan, because of its atmosphere. And as those first pictures came back, we just saw more and more haze and fog and haze and haze until finally the probe broke through that haze and we got to see the surface of Titan for the first time. Next, Cassini had... Cassini then captured giant jets of water spewing hundreds of miles into space from the tiger stripes, shooting out at 1,200 miles per hour, vaporizing and then freezing. Back on Earth, Cassini's stunned controllers quickly reprogrammed the probe to fly right through the jets, collecting particles. And what they found was even more stunning. Organic molecules, the basic building blocks of life. Enceladus is really special. It's giving us free samples. Because the geysers are erupting and they could guide the spacecraft very close and look to see if there's water there, and there is water. Here on Earth, wherever there's liquid water, whether it's deep in the ocean and very hot or in rocky places or in ice, there's microbial life. So it certainly suggests microbial life could have evolved on Enceladus because it has all the properties that the Earth had when life began here. NASA controllers plotted the probe's deadly descent into Saturn's atmosphere. productive until the end. Cassini relayed detailed information about the planet's environment. And then she burned like a meteor and vaporized. Scientists will build on Cassini's contributions as the search for extraterrestrial life continues within our solar system and beyond. Perhaps around the star system, 39 light years away known as TRAPPIST-1. The first place found, NASA announced, to have multiple planets. Three here, circling a single star inside the habitable zone, where liquid water can exist. Well, with this discovery, we've made a giant accelerated leap forward in the search for habitable worlds and life on other worlds, potentially speaking. The TRAPPIST-1 system has really captured our imagination because with this amazing system, we know that there must be many more potentially life-bearing worlds out there just waiting to be found. Earth-like in size and temperature, these three faraway worlds suggest endless possibilities. The discovery gives us a hint that finding a second Earth is not just a matter of if, but when. These questions about are we alone are being answered as we speak in this decade and the next decades. So I'm really excited about this. It's been an astonishing year for sure. And as our universe reveals more of its secrets, far out in space and closer to home, our foundation of knowledge will continue to grow, promising ever more to come.